Would you like to improve your practice of mindfulness of breathing? Today I'm going to discuss an early text that talks about five ways we can indeed improve our own mindfulness practice, in particular mindfulness of breathing. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org, where you can find courses about early Buddhist Dharma. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to this channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. So recently I did uh, a couple of videos talking about the practice of mindfulness of breathing following the early texts, a practice of 16 stages. If you're not familiar with the practice, I'll leave a link to those videos down below in the show notes. They come from, or at least have been discussed, uh, in a recent book by uh, Bhante Analyo, Bhikkhu Analyo, who was a wonderful scholar of the early Buddhist texts um, and has done a lot of research into comparing the, Ch the Pali and the Chinese versions of some of these texts to try to tease out what might have been their earliest kinds of incarnations, how they might have uh, been produced, how they might have historically uh, grown and changed and all the rest. And in that book, uh, Analyo talks about an early text that's only found, I believe, in the Chinese uh, that talks about five ways that we can uh, ground or improve our practice of mindfulness of breathing. The first tip that this text suggests is that we uphold the moral training, what's called, what's known as, in Pali as sila, or ethics, uh, sometimes glossed as the the, the, the five precepts that we basically work so as not to harm other things. We don't steal, steal, we don't kill, we don't commit sexual misconduct, we don't lie, we don't uh, take uh, intoxicating drugs. Those are the kinds of things that we try to avoid. And why, why does this have to do with mindfulness of breathing? Now, it does. In, in early Buddhism, in fact, in all of Buddhism, really, is the idea that ethics is kind of the, the groundwork here that, that lies underneath our ability to be able to practice meditation well. And that's because if we behave in ways that are harmful, if we behave in ways that are unethical, that will tend to uh, create remorse in, our, in ourselves. And that instead of being able to have sit with a calm mind, and a placid mind, will be sitting with remorse. And remorse is going to be the sort of thing, uh, regrets, that cloud the mind, that, that stir up our emotions, that worry us. Perhaps we'll worry about uh, somebody attacking us because we've been bad to them, or, or abusing us because we've abused them. Perhaps we're sorry for things that we've done that we want to make better. And all of these things tend to so again, stir up our mind and make it difficult for us to sit in a way that's calm. And I began this video by talking about making a, our lives a kinder and calmer. And that's exactly the point here, is that by behaving in a way that is not harmful to others, or not har harmful also to ourselves, because obviously we can also harm ourselves and be remorseful on that, on that end too, uh, we're going to find it easy to be calm because we don't have these kinds of regrets. The second tip for improving our practice of mindfulness of breathing is to have few wishes, to cultivate few wishes. Uh, that is to say, to have what we might term a minimalist kind of lifestyle. There are different ways, I think, of approaching our lives. Uh, one, of, one of them is to have few wishes. The other is to have many wishes or extravagant wishes, to want all kinds of things and then to strive for them. And I would submit that for many of us nowadays, even perhaps most of us, it's the second way that we tend to live our lives. Uh, thinking that by pursuing many or great things, we're going to uh, make our lives greater, we're going to make our lives happier and fuller. Uh, perhaps we're going to escape the, the, the pain and suffering and uh, ordinary sense of unsatisfactoriness that clouds our life by simply striving after one thing and another. And 
what this does, this kind of behavior, is to, again, as in the last case, stir up our minds, to make our minds non-placid, to make our minds full of concerns and worries of, of having to attain this, that, and the other thing. Or how do we attain the money to get this, that, and the other thing? How do we work hard enough to get this so that we can get that, so that we can get the, the car that we want or the house that we want, so that we can get, so we can fulfill all these wishes? And of course we know very well if we reflect upon it for a time that whenever we fulfill one wish, another wish comes in its place. So it's not as though we can, you know, we have ten wishes, we fulfill them all, and we'll be done. We, we know that's not the case. If we fulfill ten wishes, there'll only be ten or fifteen or a hundred more coming after them. So this is a kind of uh, a hamster wheel of wishes that really makes meditation difficult. And for that, for that reason, cultivating a life of few wishes is really one of our practices, I think, one of our baseline practices that will make our meditation easier. Third, this text suggests that we don't overdo eating and drinking. Eating and drinking, necessary for life. But as we all know, if you overeat and overdrink, you're liable to make yourself sluggish. It makes meditation difficult. I think many of us who have tried meditating just after having a meal will know that you tend to get sleepy and heavy. The mind is heavy, weighed down by the food that we've just eaten. And if we eat a lot, it's not going to be to our benefit long term. It's going to be uh, even potentially uh, dangerous to our health. So it's best not to overeat, not to overdrink, not to overindulge, as it were. That by keeping our just as with the previous case, with our wishes. By keeping our wishes when it comes to food relatively reasonable, we'll find it easier to meditate. Now, this isn't to say we have to avoid all cheat meals every day. Uh, there's going to be, a, I think, a middle ground here where on special occasions, once in a while, we're going to have a meal that, that is, is bigger than normal. That's fine. But the point here is this middle ground should be the ordinary way to live our lives so that the cheat meals become rare once at a time, one, you know, in, in, in few, few times in our lives rather than the way that we always eat and drink. The fourth suggestion for improving our meditation is not to oversleep. Now, when we read this early text, it's clear that it was written for monastics who are very, very serious meditators, who have a very serious and long-term meditation practice of many hours every day. It's said, and I don't have experience with this myself, but it is said that if you meditate for many, many, many hours a day, you end up not needing as much sleep. Um, so, uh, for example, it's said that people can, uh, if they have huge meditation practices, can get away with, let's say, three or four hours of sleep a night. Again, I don't have experience of that myself, uh, but that is the way this particular uh, bit of the text is written, that you should really only get, you know, like, let's say, four hours of sleep a night or three hours of sleep a night. Uh, I would, therefore, modify this a little bit for those of us in the modern world and say that we really should be looking to get enough sleep, but not too much. That is the sort of middle ground. Because I think for most of us, the problem is less that we get too much sleep and more that we get too little. That with our busy, active lives nowadays, uh, many of us simply don't sleep enough. And a lack of sleep can be a real problem if, we're trying to, if we have a meditation practice. Uh, I know, this I do know from my own experience, that if I haven't slept well the previous night or enough, uh, I will tend to be very d drowsy during meditation. Meditation will not be very successful. Now, every meditation is successful to an extent. It teaches you about the character of your own experience. However, if you're spending your meditation simply dozing off, then your time spent actually in the meditation is relatively short because you're, you're basically sort of half sleeping all the time. And this goes for 
our own uh, well-being as well, that, that health is dependent upon getting enough sleep. So let's take this particular suggestion to be to get enough sleep, but not too much. The fifth way that we can benefit our meditation experience, benefit uh, breathing meditation, is, it said, to dwell in an empty place in the forest, secluded from din and bustle. Now, this is a kind of a wonderful thing to contemplate, but again, it's going to be something that, for most of us, is not going to be very likely. Uh, some of us will have the opportunity, perhaps, to go to a retreat off in some forest spot that is secluded. Others of us may be lucky enough to have a place that we can go to that is very, very much in the forest or out, out of the din and bustle of ordinary society. But for most of us, uh, we're going to be having to deal with ordinary society every day. And what are we going to make of this particular suggestion then? Well, what I would say is the point, of course, one point is that when we're doing meditation, we do want to have a place that's quiet and secluded where we can be uninterrupted for a period of time. That goes without saying. But in a, I think the point here is a broader one than just how we're spending that half hour, 45 minutes, hour every day, and more about how we're spending our entire lives. That is, that we may want to consider to what extent uh, we want to be in the bustle of ordinary society, and to what extent we may want a life that is a little bit more retired from that bustle. We may not have an option here, but at least there may be things that we can do from time to time. Perhaps, again, taking a vacation outside of this craziness, off in a relatively secluded space somewhere, or going to a retreat. There are many places that will have retreats. As, as I'm speaking this, we're in the middle of coronavirus, so retreats are kind of on hold for now. Uh, but they'll come back, and uh, they'll certainly be around uh, when some of you are watching this video. Perhaps you're watching it when these retreats are options again. There's always things that we can do. Perhaps even go camping. Uh, if a retreat is too expensive, uh, we can get, get a, a tent and, and a sleeping bag and, and go off in the forest somewhere. All of these are going to be ways that we essentially come to ha lead a more minimalist lifestyle. Now, what do I, when I say minimalism, what am I saying? Uh, there's been a recent, uh, actually it's quite recent, kind of movement towards what's known as minimalism. Uh, that is to say, paring down our lives into what's more essential to us, and leaving out a lot of the, the ordinary uh, life of, of, of buying, of, of, of acquiring, the acquisition of things, that we simply store places, into a more, uh, I, I think, a, a more deeply thought out way of living. Now, I've done a, a number of videos on the idea of minimalism and how it relates to an early Buddhist conception of the, the better way of living, and there are really a lot of overlaps here. And I'm going to put a, a playlist up here on the screen uh, of, of these videos, and I would suggest ch taking a look at them and seeing how they could help your meditation experience. Thanks so much. If you're getting something out of these videos, take a look at my Patreon page and see if you want to help us out and get something in return for it.